We'll go and get started. Let's uh, ask God's blessings upon our time and let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We're thankful, Lord, to be here. We're thankful for the Word of God that we are, uh, are able to read, that we're able to study. And Father, we do ask and pray, Lord God, that you would help us tonight to see what it is from your Word that you'd have us know. Lord, we know and we understand that the book of Romans is certainly a deep book, and there's much in it, Lord, that we desire to know, that we long to know. And some aspects of it, Lord, are so deep into the mind of God that we will never be able to fully tap into that and to know in its fullness what a particular doctrine might mean. But Lord, give us tonight um, the understanding that you would allow us to have. We pray for all those that will be uh, coming uh, here in the next uh, few minutes, Lord, as they are coming to the class tonight. Give them safety as they do so. And again, may we rightly divide the word of truth this evening and see from the word what you would have us know. And we, Lord, we love you and we're thankful for your son, Jesus. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, you can open up to Romans chapter number 9. We're going to finish up <clears throat> Romans chapter number 9. And as always, we want to very quickly do a review over what we've been uh, looking into. And, you know, Romans is, is such a tremendous book. And, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's, it's so deep and it's so rich and it's so full that... You know, you wonder if any uh, commentary on the book of Romans would ever even be able to come close to properly exegeting the text, expositing what the words, what the words of Scripture says. It's been said that the, um, if you've ever heard of or had a chance to read um, the, um, the Treasury of David by Charles Spurgeon, that's Charles Spurgeon's uh, commentary on all 150 psalms. Now, not all the 150 psalms are psalms of David. He penned just, I think, a little uh, over or under half of them. And uh, I think a little uh, under half. But they said that if he had done the same for Romans, that we would have the greatest commentary on the book of Romans that has ever been, been penned. Because if you've ever read... Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he uh, has a God-given gift to make uh, the truth of Scripture and present it to us that are reading it in a very a different way, in a way that, it, that will help us. And, and, the, and the book of Romans has also been called the Gospel according to Paul. We have obviously the four Gospels and Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Romans has been called the Gospel according to Paul. And it's been called the greatest treatise on the Gospel that has ever been, been been penned. And so as I was praying, I was, you know, just, just saying as we were praying that, um, you know, it's, it's impossible for us to really uh, tap into the depths of what uh, the book of Romans is saying. But thankfully we have things, uh, we do have commentaries that can help us, uh, uh, you know, learn and know uh, what we can know. And so in the book of Romans, as we've been studying since uh, March or February, I can't remember which one it was, I think at the beginning of March. We'll be looking at the, at, the, at the righteousness of God. And we obviously know that that is, a, that that is something <clears throat> that God is. Um, it is a part of His nature. That, and, it, and it plays closely with His holiness. Someone has said that His holiness is who He is, His righteousness is what He does. I think it's interchangeable to an extent, holiness and righteousness. But... Um, in Romans, we'll be learning about the righteousness of God. And in the first part, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through the end of chapter 8, we learned about the revelation of the righteousness of God and how God <clears throat> um, showed us and shows us in uh, the first chapter through the end of chapter, or through part of chapter 3, first 17 verses of Romans dealt uh, as the introduction to the book. And the um, verses 16 and 17, as we've been talking about the past couple of weeks, serve as the, uh, the theme of the book. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. You know, God requires righteousness to get to heaven. Okay, how, 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 do, we, how do we achieve this righteousness? Well, for one thing... Righteousness is not achievable on our own merits. What, you know, what, 
what we do. Uh, we'll look tonight, very just a few uh, uh, verses, about uh, the inability of, of attaining righteousness by keeping the law, because it is, it is an impossibility to keep the law. And so, because God has revealed His righteousness, and in 118 through 320, showed us, the, showed us uh, and taught us and teaches us about condemnation, the need for His righteousness. We stand before God, condemned, and, you know, no way to ever meet uh, the, the, the bar of a just and holy God. And, you know, it's amazing that people are under the delusion that they can earn eternal life. Because they've never really, I don't think, ever truly understood and known just that God requires perfection. Well, okay, if that's what God requires, I mean, we as sinful, fallen humanity... We, how do we ever, uh, how do we ever get that? Well, we we we, you know, we learn through um, first couple of chapters about condemnation. <clears throat> we need God's righteousness because you know because of our sin nature, the fact that we were born this way, the fact that we act this way, makes us condemned before God. And he talked about the guilt of the Gentile. That's you know really. Um, the word Gentiles basically means, means nations, all other nations that are not, not Israel. The guilt of the Gentile, there's, there, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's the unrighteousness of, of, of man. Uh, you know, God's wrath is, is, is revealed against it. We learn in Romans 1. So, uh, the, the Gentile is guilty. And I'm sure the Jew reading this would have taken this as a badge of, of honor. Well, see, see, everybody else is this way, but then Paul talks about, in chapter 2, talks about the guilt of the Jew. He said, in chapter 2, he said, just because, 2 verse 1, therefore you have no excuse, O man, he's talking to Jews, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And so he's just saying, not only are the Gentiles guilty, but you Jews are guilty as well. Because of what Christ did, Yes, the Jews at one point, and really still at this point, have an advantage over all the rest of mankind. Yeah, they're still God's chosen people. They're His covenant people. But because of what Christ did, He leveled that field. And as we learned last week, it was never because they were just descendants of Abraham. They had to come and become the true Israel through Christ. But He's saying, Jew and Gentile, it, it, it's, it's no longer one way or the other. You're all on the same playing field. You all have to come to God in the same way, and that's through Christ. So he talked about the guilt, the guilt of the Gentile, the guilt of the Jew. <clears throat> he talked about how they were judged according to the truth. They're judged by their works. They're judged with impartiality, that the Jews did not obey the law, that they didn't believe the oracles that were preached to them. And in his conclusion, a passage very, very familiar to us, chapter 3, verses 9 through the end of, or through verse 20, he talks about that, whether you're Gentile or Jew, which basically encompasses all of humanity anyway, all are guilty before God. That's why he, or that's when he wrote verses like, there is none, none righteous, no, not one. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. All are unrighteous. There's no one that does good, not even one, and so forth. So, but then, <clears throat> as he, you know, always was one to give the bad news, he then gave the good news in describing Another way that God revealed His righteousness was not only through condemnation, showing us that all mankind, Jew and Gentile, stood condemned before God. Starting in chapter 3, verse 21, all the way through um, the end of chapter 5, he talked about justification, being declared righteous by God, being declared not guilty before, before a holy God. But, not only, but, but being justified wasn't enough. Being declared not guilty wasn't enough. We needed more than this. We needed Christ's righteousness. And so that's why God imputed this righteousness to us. We have no righteousness of our own. Just being declared not guilty, but we still don't have our own righteousness to be able to get into heaven. So we need someone else's righteousness, and that was Christ. And so when we come to faith in, in, in Him, God takes the righteousness of Christ and He imputes it to our account. And in verse uh, 21 through 31 of chapter 3, he, he, he describes this righteousness. Uh, in chapter 4, he gave an illustration of the righteousness. He talked about somebody that they would know very well. That was Abraham. And he, say, and, and he, he, 
he focused on four things about Abraham in talking about righteousness that the Jews would have been confused about. He says, first of all, that Abraham's righteousness was apart from works. You know. He also said that it was apart from circumcision. There were many uh, false teachers that, w that um, infiltrated churches that Paul helped plant. And these false teachers, called the Judaizers, would say, well, yes, salvation is by grace through faith, but, it's, but it is still about circumcision. It is still about the law, keeping the law. But he's saying the righteousness of Abraham, but of course that's not true. He is saying that, that, that the righteousness that Abraham had, because he believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness, it was apart from works, it was apart from circumcision, it was apart from the law, and it was by faith. Now, now no, Christ had not died yet, but he looked forward to that and placed his faith in that. And then he talked about, he described righteousness, what it is. He gave an illustration of it in Abraham. And then he gave the benefits of it. There's peace with God. There's joy and tribulation. And there's uh, salvation apart from God's wrath. That we no longer stand under God's wrath. That we are no longer an object of his wrath. But we, ha we have been, or, or there's been peace made by the blood of Christ's cross. And so we, are, we have peace with God. But not only do we have peace with God, we are now one of his own sons or daughters. We've been adopted into God's family. And then in chapter 6, verses 1 through um, the end of chapter 8, <clears throat> which we finished a couple of weeks ago, the ways in which God had revealed his righteousness was through condemnation, showing us that we needed his righteousness. He showed it through justification and not just condemning us and showing us that we were condemned, but he made it possible for us to become righteous. Now, he didn't have to do that, and, and, we'll, and we'll see this tonight. He didn't have to do any of that, but because of his love for us and wanting to demonstrate that love for us, not just saying it, but actually demonstrating it, he provided Christ. And so uh, we learned that. And also, um, 6, 1 through the end of chapter 8, we learned about sanctification. This is the demonstration of God's righteousness. If we stood condemned before God, we had no righteousness of our own, and then when we came to Christ, he justified us, and he imputed to us Christ's righteousness, there should be signs that that has taken place. Many times people claim that they know Christ and there's no visible evidence at all. Well, that's the teaching that as sanctification, <clears throat> we are positionally righteous. Again, we have no righteousness of our own. We receive Christ's righteousness. That's why when, you know, we come to the Father through Him, not through us, because we cannot come on anything of our own because we have nothing. But we, ha but we have righteousness if we have um, salvation. And so, <clears throat> um, sanctification is not only being positionally righteous, but um, um, sanctification also involves growing in holiness. And each and every day, taking these steps of, of our, you know, uh, taking these steps in our walk with the Lord, in, you know, becoming less like uh, the way that we were and more like Christ. And so that's sanctification. We talked about sanctification and sin, that the believer is dead to sin in just in principle, because the Bible teaches it. The believer is dead to sin in practice. You know, again, our, our, our sin natures, we were, we were slaves to it. We did whatever it asked. But now that we have uh, the Holy Spirit, we're no longer servants to sin. Yes, we still fight our flesh. And yes, there's that battle between the flesh and the spirit. But we don't have to do what our sin nature wanted us to do like we did before. We always did what it wanted. Now, we, now, yes, we do still yield to that at times. We yield to that temptation, but we don't have to do that anymore. We can listen to the Spirit and how He prompts us to live righteously. We talked about sanctification in the law, that we're dead to the law but alive to God. We learned about how the law cannot deliver from sin. And then when, and then when I had the chance to teach a couple of weeks ago, we learned about sanctification and, and the Spirit, the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, takes a tremendous role in our lives when we come to know Him. Uh, just, just the other day, I was able to um, uh, visit someone that's dying of cancer, and this person just recently made a profession of faith, which we were grateful for. But, you, all, but, you know, whenever somebody makes a profession of faith, you believe that that's true, but then you begin to watch the person and see, is there going to be any evidence, any, any um, you know, sanctification in this, that's evident in this person's life? And so... Uh, I had gone over there and I was leaving and this, this uh, person's mom uh, shared with me on Sunday that after I left and she had gone back to the house, he had asked her, Mom, why is it that I feel bad when I don't read my Bible? 
you know, he hadn't felt that way before. And, and she explained, well, you know, when you, when you um, come to know Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence in your life. And one of the things that he does is, he, is that he convicts of sin. And if there's something that we know to do and, and we don't do it, then the Holy Spirit will make us, well, you know, he'll, he'll point that out and so forth. And I told her, I said, that's a good sign. You know, that, you know that, that's, that, that's a good sign that shows that, yeah, he, he may in fact um, does know the Lord. You know, so that's good. So when we come to Christ, you know, Christ said, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the Comforter. And so when we come to Christ, we have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us now who will help us uh, take these steps of, of sanctification. And so he does many things, not um, exclusively uh, found just in these verses. There's a lot of verses in Scripture that talk about uh, what the Holy Spirit does and can do. But in chapter 8, we would have seen, I should probably turn there myself, chapter 8, we had seen about how the Spirit delivers from the power of the flesh. You know, again, even though we've been redeemed and even though we've been saved, we still have our flesh. Now, one day our flesh will be completely eradicated and we will no longer have the flesh anymore, but here on earth we still have it. And so our flesh is still pulling us to do one particular thing, but now that we know Christ, the Holy Spirit is pulling us to do what's right. You know, we, we set the alarm for early in the morning and, you know, before work or before we uh, uh, get up to go get the kids ready for school, whatever, and we say, I'm going to get up at this time and I'm going to read my Bible. So you set the alarm and it goes off in the morning and then that's when the battle starts. You know, we, we get out of bed and our, and our spirit is saying, okay, here's the alarm that's going off. Let's get out of bed. Let's hit our knees and let's pray. Let's read our Bible. But our flesh is saying, no, I, this is, you're more comfortable horizontal than you are on your knees. And so that, that battle goes on there. So that's, that's the flesh, just like Galatians talks about. The flesh pulls you one way, the spirit pulls you another way, and we're going to have, that's why at times the, the Christian life is a struggle. Because the flesh wants you to do one thing, the spirit wants to do something else. So, but the flesh doesn't have the kind of power over us like it did before, before we knew the Lord. And, and the Spirit is one who can help with that. He also gives sonship. You know, again, we, were, we stood before God condemned, but now not only are we, have we been, or has there been reconciliation made, we've, we've, we've uh, come to peace with God, but He took us into His own family, the ones who sinned, crucified His Son. That's astounding. The Spirit delivers from the power of the flesh. He gives sonship. He assures of future glory. Um, verses 18 through 30 of chapter 8 uh, talk about that. And then in verses 31 through 39, um, it talks about the Spirit assuring a final victory. And so <clears throat> last week, we started part two of um, the book of Romans and talking about the vindication of the righteousness of God. And, <clears throat> you know, last week, and as I was studying this, this afternoon, you know, chapters 9, 10, and 11 is a part of, not that the other parts of it are not this way. They are. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 <clears throat> are passages in Romans that are extremely hard at times um, to really, uh, you know, to try to fully understand what the Bible is teaching. And you can have commentaries and, you know, you can have the Greek manuscript there, you can have the Greek New Testament, you can have all these things. And even so, it, you know, it could go this way, one interpretation is this, one interpretation is that. And uh, in just talking about election, that God choosing in eternity past people to, to, that he would choose to regenerate and redeem, and so, you know, you ask things like, does that mean this? What about double, uh, double predestination? All that. So uh, I'm not going to admit that I have all the answers because I don't. I'm thankfully able to admit that. Don't ask, so, don't ask, so don't ask me questions. No, no you can ask me. Uh, but, uh, I mean, these, these, these things are really hard to answer. Because, but, but we have to keep in mind, as we'll see tonight, that, you know, these seeming paradoxes are in the mind of God. Now, they're not paradoxes to God. These are just in the mind of God. He's chosen to not give us the mental capacity to understand it. 
you know, but even if something like double predestination to where God could, in eternity past, past, could choose those that he is going to redeem and choose those that he will damn to hell. I mean, to us, that seems like, whoa, that, that, that just grates on us and we, we, we you know, will go insane trying to figure that one out, but that, that is well within God's prerogative to do that. Again, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but he's God. He's the one that's in charge. He's, he's God. And so if that's what he wanted to do, if that's what he chose to do, that's, that's, that's God's business, not mine. So, but then again, it's hard to, again, to, to understand that, to try to explain to somebody else. I mean, you, you might have a level of understanding about that, but trying to explain that to somebody else, and especially someone that doesn't know the Lord or, or maybe someone that's trying to understand it themselves, these kinds of things are hard. So, um, But last week we talked, we were in chapter 9. We didn't quite, we only went about 14 verses in, but we had, we're, we, we've been looking at the nation of Israel, their past, their present, and their future, and about God's, God's choosing them. Again, God chose Israel and he didn't choose the other nations. I mean, he could have chosen any nation that was there in Canaan. He could have chosen any nation that was in the known world to be his people, but he didn't choose those people. Those people could have been, uh, you know, you could have done the research and found that this people group over here, this nation, were better candidates than the people of Israel were. And so you say, well, why didn't God choose them and, you know, not choose them and choose Israel? That's just because that's just the way that God did it. He chose Israel. He, he didn't choose them. And we saw last week about how in the first five verses of chapter 9, Paul sort of <clears throat> um, was talking about this kind of thing, talking about Israel's past, how they were elected, and how they were, you know, how they were the ones through whom the Messiah would come, and they were the ones through whom God would bless the world. He had promised all the way back in Genesis 3, I will send you know, the... The seed of the woman will be the one that will redeem mankind. And then fast forward a couple um, hundred years or, or a thousand years or so, and then we come to Abraham. And then he was the one that God chose as, you know, your, your um, people and your descendants and your sons and daughters are going to be as numerous as the sands of the sea. And so eventually we begin to learn through his son Isaac and then his grandson Jacob that that was going to be the nation of Israel, God's covenant people, and that was made official at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. So, so <clears throat> Paul is trying to wrap his mind around the fact that even though they, had, they were God's people, God had promised to Abraham back in Genesis 12, he's saying, I'm going to bless the whole world through you and your line. Wow, what a privilege that would be, including the coming of the Messiah, the one that would be Israel's Messiah and would be the one that would uh, uh, fix mankind's sin problem. He's saying, even though... They know this. Now, they rejected Jesus as Messiah. Now, he was the Messiah, and they rejected him. And they're still, even today, go up to someone at the, to a Jew at the Wailing Wall and ask them what they're praying for. They're praying for the Messiah to come. And, it, and that's, that's, that's kind of sad. Because you, you want to say, he already came, and you rejected him. You know, so, Paul, so, so you kind of see Paul's heart is that his heart is breaking for his people and saying, you're the Jews, you're God's people, you should have already seen who, uh, who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah, and you missed it. And so in, ver in the first five verses of chapter 9, we had seen that, um, that even despite how privileged they were, God's people, Paul just, he was, his heart was broken because they, they you know, they, they um, you know, they had, <clears throat> you know, um, the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law. This is verse 4. The worship, the promises, to them belong the patriarchs and all these things. Um, but then he, but before he said that, he said, um, verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. He said, I would, all, he said, I would be willing to be anathema for them. That's the Greek there. I would be willing to be, to be if it were possible, because if you study the way that the Greek is written, he said, if it were possible, but it wasn't, if it were possible, he's saying, I would almost be willing to, to die and go to hell so that they would be able to go to heaven. That was his heart for his own people. I mean, that's astounding. So he talks about that in the first five verses. And then in, in verses um, 
6 through the end of, or through uh, for, uh, verse 6 through verse 29, um, he, he talked about God's sovereignty. He illustrated the fact of God's choosing Israel over his people. That's kind of the backdrop, God choosing Israel over, over another nation. But he's really, he's talking about choice. God, God's, it's, it's God's prerogative to choose things as he sees fit, to choose it and to order it in a way that honors him, even if we don't understand it completely. And so uh, he gave some illustrations. He talked about in verses, or verses 6 through 18, he illustrated. He said, let me give you some illustrations about choices throughout history that God has made in the history of the Jewish people that God chose, and in our minds, our finite minds, we would think, I wouldn't have chosen that. But again, <laughs> it doesn't matter what we, would have, what we would think is right to choose or not. God chose it, so that's the way that it needs to be. He talked about choosing Isaac over Ishmael. You know, again, Abraham and his wife <clears throat> had been promised what they'd been promised by God, that they were going to have a son of the promise. And, you know, God promised that. You're, I mean, yes, Abraham, you're, you're almost a century old. Your wife is in her 90s. And I know that you're way past the childbearing age, you know, but just have faith in me and you will have a son. And they waited and waited and waited and nothing was happening. And so they exercised unbelief by, you know, we know the story. He gave, she gave, her, gave um, uh, her handmaiden Hagar to Abraham. And from that union, there was a son, Ishmael, who was born. And, and once again, when God revisited Abraham and sort of uh, went back over this covenant with him, saying, you know, your, your descendants are going to be like the sand of the seashore, all this, God, uh, um, Abraham tried to push Ishmael to be that promised boy. He's like, look, God, I, you know, my wife and I are, are not able to have children, but I have a son. Can we just have him be the one? And, it, and, and God said, no, your wife will have a son. And about nine months later, Isaac was born. And so he was, he was the one that God wanted. Again, a perfectly good son right here. So, you know, God, here's, here's Ishmael. But no, he was, he was the product of unbelief. And so he said, you know, God, no, I don't, yes. He is a descendant of Abraham. That's true. He is. But I want my line to go through Isaac, the one that I said. He, so he brought up that. Verses 10 through 13 of chapter 9, he went further and said, uh, talked about Jacob over Esau. Again, keeping in mind with Israel as the backdrop, got, uh, Paul talking about choosing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> somebody might say, well, you know, God chose Isaac over Ishmael. Well, that was an easy choice for God to make. You know, because again, you know, you have Ishmael, who was the son brought of this union of unbelief. You know, he didn't have that going for him. God could have looked into the life of, I, or of um, Isaac and Ishmael and seen that Isaac, he lived a good life and Ishmael didn't, he didn't live such a great life. And so, and so because Isaac lived better than Ishmael, I'm going to go with him. Well, that, that's, that's what people would have thought. So what, so what they in their minds would have said is, well, that's not really a good example, Paul, because Isaac was so much better of a candidate than Ishmael was, and so that sort of tipped the scale in his favor. And so that's why he brings up Jacob and Esau. He says, Jacob and Esau, you know, you can, you can solve the problem of, you know, Ishmael coming from the Egyptian woman, Hagar, and Isaac coming from Sarah. You can solve that problem by saying, well, we have two sons coming from the same mother. And they're twins. So, I mean, they're, they're the exact same. And they may, maybe they didn't look the same. They may be, not have been identical. But you have, not only are they brothers from the same mom, but they are also twin brothers. So that knocks that away. And so you not only have that, but, uh, I mean, they're the exact same. They're from the same mother. And so, see, now, now we figured it out. But, again, God chose Jacob over Esau. Uh, verse 13, Paul is quoting and citing Malachi here, the prophet, as it is written, because Malachi, or, uh, this is the verse here, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, we should not understand that in the emotional sense, because God loved both, I, uh, both um, Jacob and Esau. But basically, the way that we, the, the way that we should, um, should understand this is that 
is that just that, that basically teaches that God chose Jacob and at the same time in choosing Jacob did not choose Esau. And so again, um, we, we would, you know, the worst, the, the uh, first question coming to my mind would say, well, why did he choose one or the other? Well, sometimes God might tell us why he did a particular thing, but he doesn't have to tell us anything. And we even might get to the point where we dangerously begin to accuse God of being unfair. Well, you should have chosen this guy over this guy because of these reasons. You should have chosen this person over that because of these reasons. So Paul talks about that, uh, verse 14 here. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, meganoita. By no means, in the King James, it would read, God forbid. It's a very strong uh, uh, thing to say there. No, absolutely not. For he says to Moses, he's always bringing up illustrations of people that the Israelites, that the Jews would have known. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends, verse 16, not on human will. That phrase in the Greek literally means the one willing. Hey, I'm willing to be that. Well, no, that, it's not based on that. It's not based on human will or exertion. That phrase means the one running, really pushing themselves. Again, just human effort. It's not based on human effort, but on God who has mercy. And so right there, uh, Paul uh, uses this, this argument more than once in this lesson tonight. He's just saying, you know, because notice the first, what the first part of verse 14 says, what shall we say then? Well, who... When has our opinion ever mattered? Now, I mean, I think, you know, God um, loves us and he values us. And, but, I mean, really, when it comes down to it, when are we ever going to say enough that would, um, um, I, I, I hesitate to say that it wouldn't matter to God. It matters to God what we say. But, I mean, to try to say that what you think and what you feel God should have done really matters, it doesn't. Because God, I mean, God is God, and it's his prerogative to choose things the way that he would uh, have for them to be, even if they don't uh, jive with what we're thinking in our, our um, brains. And so what shall we say then? Well, I think these are rhetorical questions. Nothing. But, he, but, he, but, he's, but Paul is kind of reading our minds here. It says, is there any injustice on God's part? Well, absolutely not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. He, this is from Exodus 33, 19. He's citing... Verse, um, verse 16, so then it depends on human, or I'm sorry, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, he brings up another person. He had brought up the illustrations of Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau. Then he brings up Pharaoh. And this is where it can get kind of murky here. And, and verses 22 and 23 is where someone might uh, wonder if the Bible teaches double predestination. Now, again, that's a whole other can of worms, and we would run out of time to talk about that and um, save that one for Pastor when he gets back. Um, um, but um, verse uh, 17, For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever uh, he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. And so he's uh, bringing up the illustration of uh, Pharaoh in saying, Pharaoh may have thought to himself that he was responsible for, <clears throat> you know, his birth, that he was born into the royal family, that he, <clears throat> you know, uh, out of... Many of the sons of Pharaoh, because I'm sure Pharaoh had a lot of other sons uh, that could have become the new Pharaoh, but he said, out of all the other sons of Pharaoh, you were the one that ascended to the throne. He could have thought that because, mainly because of him, that he went all the way to become Pharaoh. But God says, no, for this very purpose, I have raised you up. God was in control of all that. So again, we may think that we have a grasp on, on things, but God is saying, no, I am, am the one that is in charge of it all. Even if it's hard for us to, um, like I said, come to grips with things that we think the Bible might teach, and man, this is really hard you know, to grasp, and oh, I think I figured it out. No, God's, you know, this, these, these kinds of things don't, 
um, you know, bother God. He's not up, up in heaven wringing his hands because he's, he, you know, he's afraid that we're not getting it. Now, he's, 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 he's got it all figured out. He had it all figured out well before we ever came on the scene. Uh, but he said, this is the reason why, Pharaoh, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills. Again, he, he can take one that he has created and made, but that is born through the line of Adam, that's you know, like us, and he can show mercy upon that one. And he can choose that one in eternity past to come to that point in their life where they come to know the Lord. He said, I can have mercy on that one, but then somebody else I can allow to, to basically you know, take away the restraints in their life to where they pursue their sin unabated and unrestrained, and they can, and I can um, pull away the, the uh, Holy Spirit's drawing power on them to where they get so far from God that they can allow their own hearts to be hardened. And you say, well, God, that's not fair. We can't say that. Well, God, it's not fair that you would allow this person, you know, that like bringing up the illustration of Pharaoh again, the Bible talks about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart and he allowed Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. Pharaoh hardened his, and then it got to the point where Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But God, that's not fair. Are we, are we really asking God and saying that to God? Who, you know, if God was fair, he would condemn all of us. But he's, we don't want that. We don't want God to be fair. We want him to be merciful. So he's saying, look, it's my choice. I am God. I can do, now he's not saying this, you know, to, you know, forcefully or with a mean spirit, but it's just, that's what the Bible teaches. He's God. He can choose. He's the one that created it. He was the one that was here far before we ever got here. He, he created the world. He ordained it. And however he wants to work it out, that's the way that he wants to do it. Sir. I have one perspective on it. Do it. You know, a verse that uh, God desires for all to come to faith. So there had to be a point where there was something where he wasn't going to come to faith. Otherwise, God would have intended them to always. Right. And, and that's, that, I think, is where it gets, it gets hard. Because it's hard to reconcile, you know, God choosing some to come to faith, choosing those that he would um, make alive, because the Bible says that we're dead, make alive to come to faith. So, so then does that also mean that he does not choose some? And so I think the ones that he delights to choose are the ones that can come to faith in, in Christ. But that's a, but that's a, um, a good um, thought. Um, that uh, we can certainly apply to this. And I, and I think that's, that's, that's the whole thing, is when, you, when, it, when it comes into your mind that if you're saved, that you were one that God chose to have mercy upon. Whereas somebody else, God could have chosen to, just, you know, to allow them to um, go their own way and allow them to get to the point where their heart became so hard that they were basically immune to the gospel call, that that was not you, that God chose to extend mercy to you. Again, that's, you know, that person, you know, that person's not you. And I mean, you want that person to not become that way. But again, that's why God chose that for me and not for, for that person. I, I mean, again, I don't, I don't confess to know why that happens, but I think that should almost highlight in our minds, God, why would you show it to me? I mean, because I was just as undeserving of your mercy as this person that you might harden or that you might allow to become their, 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 their heart to become hard. And so I think that's what, that's what Paul is saying here. He has mercy on whomever he wills. Again, we don't, it's, this is what was frustrating me in my office this afternoon. It is this, I want to, I want to understand it and I want to know why God might choose to do this when I don't think it should be that way and, and people's corresponding and differing beliefs, it's just, it can make your head explode. But, um, you know, again, it's, it's in the mind of God and he's, he's the one that uh, uh, knows how it all works. And so, uh, you know, I don't confess to know uh, all of what it means. 
And something else that I was thinking of this morning or, or this afternoon as I was, as I was um, reading and studying is, you know, I thought to myself, you know, last week, um, with the exception of maybe a few, the class was awfully quiet. I mean, they weren't asking questions, and I'm thinking, was I just boring, or was I just, you know, just, was I helping them understand these things? So if, if, if I'm being confusing, please, please don't hesitate to ask a question. I'll do my best to answer it. But I mean, this, this stuff is, 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 is hard to work through, you know. So uh, i got to move uh, along a little bit quicker here. Um, verse 19 and following. You will say to me, then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Again, he's just, he's, I don't know if Paul himself is trying to, to answer the question either. I mean, he's the Apostle Paul. He's writing under, under the inspiration of Scripture. But I don't even know if Paul is trying to answer the question or to figure out God choosing people and not choosing people and those that he chose to come to faith and those that he may have chosen for help. I, again, I think the point that Paul is making is, who are we as the created beings to um, question the one who created? Um, and he brings up the illustration that has brought up, been brought up before back in Isaiah. Verse 21, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? I mean, the potter can take the same lump of clay and make something that he would put on his dining room table and then something else that he would put trash in. So, I mean, again, it just, it's, it's the potter's prerogative to take from the same lump, make one uh, vessel for honorable use, another for dishonorable use. Um, verse 22, what if God, desiring to know uh, his wrath and to make known his power, has endured very or with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? One that might have been prepared for destruction if one believes that God ordains some to be saved and some to end up in hell. That verse right there, I think, would show uh, what if God, desiring to show His wrath and to make known His power, has endured with much patience. Has endured with much patience. I mean, God is extremely patient with people who eventually reject the gospel to the point where, where they end up in hell. So we can't say that even then God didn't give them a chance to be redeemed. Uh, I think Brandon, you had your hand up. Yeah, Arden is uh, refusing to repent. Right? I would say so. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, so Right, like your heart becomes, I mean, like, you know. Just the ones who are refusing to be obedient, they're saying, why did you make me that way? Continue choosing. Well, uh, yeah, right. Um, I mean, again, I think it's, um, Paul's asking a lot of um, questions here of what a person might ask. Um, you know, um, who can resist his will? Who can answer back to God? One might say, as you pointed out, why would, you know, why would a person, or why would God allow that one's heart to become hardened, and so forth? So, um, and so, verse 22, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory uh, for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? So again, verses 22 and 23, it sounds like double predestination. Again, that could be one way that it... One uh, thing that Paul is teaching, it could be a few other ways. Again, I think that's something that we have to work out on our own. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Or, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm not familiar with the term double predestination. It, that would be teaching that, you know, God has predestined one person for heaven. He chose that one, and if he chose that one, then that, then that person will come to faith in Christ sometime down the road in their life. And so, as he chose one for salvation, he also chose this person over here and made it to where that in their life they will not receive Christ. And so, it would be teaching that double predestination to two individuals that he had created both from the same line of Adam, both sinners. He chooses to show mercy on this one. He chooses to um, have this one come to the point where they are saved. And he chooses and says, this one will not be saved. This one will end up in eternal judgment. That is double predestination. So I, I don't know if that answers the, the question. So again, that's hard to, that's hard to choke down. But I mean, Ed, uh, that seems like what Paul is teaching. I don't know if that's what he is or not. But uh, these, these, these kinds of things are really difficult to uh, try to figure out uh, what exactly 
Paul's teaching. So I don't know if that that I don't know, versus just plain predestination that one would go to heaven, right? And then there's nothing on the other half. I don't. Well, right. Well, I well. I I guess another way to look at it is if he chooses one. And he, and he elects that one for them to make their own choice. And then he chooses another to say they can make their own choice as well, but then that person down the road does not choose Christ. I elect them both, but, and, you know, I elect Jim and Steve. They're both elect, but Jim down the road, he does trust Christ. Steve goes down the road and does not choose Christ. So that would be another way to think of it. So again, there's, there's a, a um, number of ways to think of it. But uh, I think only Paul, uh, Paul taught only one thing. So, um, so let me just, uh, uh, so, you, so you can uh, read the uh, verses there on your, on your own there for the remainder of chapter uh, 9. Uh, that's where we will stop. Um, next week we will, um, we have just one more week next week, August 5th. We're going to really have to uh, run quick and um, go through chapters 10 and 11, uh, talking about... Um, um, Israel's present and Israel's future. And so uh, we'll, we'll look at that this next week. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thanks for the, um, for the attention, for the questions. It's hard to really know what a person might ask during a course of an hour, but it keeps you on your toes. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. <clears throat> Lord, we understand that certain aspects of the Word of God are, are hard to understand, are hard to try to work through, as we pointed out before. But Lord, if we're in this room and we know Christ as Savior, we know that you chose us before the foundation of the world to, to display your glory in our lives, to extend to us mercy, because Lord, whether we believe that a person is elect or he's not, or double, double predestination, Lord, whatever we might believe in, all people are condemned, and all are undeserving and unworthy of your mercy. And Lord, it's, it's your choice to extend that uh, grace and that mercy to whomever you will in order to glorify your name most um, in a most profound way. So Lord, help us to, to apply our hearts to the word of God, to know what it says so that we can understand it better each day. Bless the uh, prayer meeting to come. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.